Are you with me? For finally, verse 8, chapter 4, Philippians, NIV says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Father, thank you for your word. Today we, we start a series. I believe this is a series from God. And um, we're going to, we're actually going to kind of play how he plays. That means we play as long as he plays. That's, that's what it means, you know, essentially. But I really believe that this year God has had us in, in a journey of actually kind of trying to point on situations, on areas in our life that need addressing to be like, to be pruned, to be actually worked on, you know, our character. Sometimes you don't have the friends, you, I mean, sometimes we think we're rich or, or, or I don't know, we're like really good, at, like we have a lot of friends, but most of our friends don't tell us the things that they don't like about us. You know, like real friends back in the day will tell you like, I love you. But shut up, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and I, I'm not asking your friend to, to tell you like that, you know? It kind of, it sounds, it sounds crude, it sounds strong, it sounds difficult, but, but sometimes I wish one of my friends would have told me. Are you like me? That you have moments in your life that you look back and you say, God, I wish I had someone close to me that would have told me, this area in your life, we need to check that out. Or at least, can you take it to the cross? You now, for us that believe that the cross is that place that marks a beginning for all of us, you know what I mean? Sometimes there are things in our lives that don't, don't reach, that don't, that don't add up to the beginning. There are things in our lives that don't add up to that original plan from from God himself in each one of us, the truth, the truth. And sometimes we are in wonder, sometimes we are, we, we are those that are incomplete and we receive something of God but is based on our view. And sometimes we, we gotta stop scratching our heads and get on with his character. I, I, are you with me? Yeah? Today in this, in this series, we're going to come from the first topic. We're going to talk about a change of mind. And uh, we're going we're gonna to dissect several things that we can read and we can, we can understand from his rosty. We can, we can really kind of like join in with the thoughts that were happening with the people that were involved in this. But in this series, I really believe that God wants to do several things. I might summarize it in three. This is what I'm feeling from God. And the, the weeks are going to get better. So if this helps you today, get, get here to next Sunday, I guess. It is what it is. If it's not me, someone else is going to be teaching it. But you're going to get some. I think mind games are are one of those things that we, we think about them lightly, those games that we play, those things that are playing inside of us, those mindsets that we have learned from people that we admire in, in a specific thing. For example, I work with you and I admire you in A, but, but because I admire you in A, when you have something to say about B, I'm listening. And sometimes that doesn't align with the character of God. And sometimes we, we, we are transactional. We're saying, okay, but, but this person, I, I like this person, you know? And that has happened to all of us. You know, we are transactional on the way that we receive information. And we think that is even revelation. But truth be told, there's lack of Christ in most of the things that we think are revelation today. Because we don't apply them through his character. We might know the information, but we don't apply it through his character. So we might know what the Bible says, 
but we might not be applying it in the context of his character. So uh, there's a discrepancy there. And of course, if there's a discrepancy there, we're going to have discrepancy on the results. I don't know you, but I, I'm getting older. And that's not rocket science. Um, and um, shut up. <laughs> There's some people laughing. Yeah? It's like disrespectful. But the more, the more I, I get to know Christ, the more I see that there are some things that I thought I knew about him, and they were technical. They were information, but I had no revelation because revelation has nothing to do with your mind. It has to do with the way that it operates in you. It is a way of transformation. It's not information. It's transformation. So when we see this and through this series, we, we're going to say, Lord, how do I think? We're going to study how do we think? And some of us will like, kind of like think, well, like, I know how I think. No, you don't. No, you don't. Can you help yourself, maybe tap yourself in the shoulders like, hey, don't try it. Don't try it. How do we think? Because most of the times when we think we know where that thought is coming from, we're just responding to an impulse. We're just responding to a flashlight, to an illusion, a false light. And sometimes we say, this is how I am. And culturally, this is how we, how we deal with thoughts. This is how I am. You are completely demanding of yourself to cover over a massive gap only by trusting what your reputation says. Do you know that your thinking creates a reputation, but your reputation is very far from God most of the times. Are you with me? We're in the country that rep, like, like literally worships reputation. You know, oh, we have kings and queens and we have all this and that and the other. You know, are you assured of who you are? Because the Bible actually asks us not to know Christ, but to be known by Christ. That's real reputation. And our thoughts carry us to him or carry us distant from him, away from him. So, yes, mind games. We're going to talk about how we do, how do we think. We're going to talk about, second, our thought patterns. These weeks are going to be amazing. Our thought patterns. Where are we going with our thoughts and how did we get to think them? And more importantly, what are the produce? What, what does it produce? Where does it end up? And thirdly, if you're with me, how to be free from thoughts and their consequences. Yeah, I didn't get any amens from that one. I thought I was going to get some, you know, I thought. Today we're talking about a change, a change of mind. A change of mind and um, we're talking about a background, an internal conversation and we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit inside of us, in our minds, in our lives, in the daily, okay? So when we go into this word, we have to start and, and if in your heart you can, you can circle this, finally. Can you, in your heart just finally, finally, I don't know you, but when my mom used to say, finally, I don't know how, how much, you know, attitude people had around you or kind of extroversion of their thoughts, feelings, and life was about, you know, around you. Because maybe you were born in a freezer, so people said, finally. But I wasn't born in a freezer. You know, I was born in a family that had feelings and thoughts, you know, and they say, finally. Finally, and I don't think God is criticizing us, you know, and I don't, put, I don't put that weight on that. But sometimes it's better for us to think on this 
in a more realistic way, finally. After I have said so many other things. If we go into the context, Paul was actually trying to explain how to live and abide, you know, in situations that were less than formidable. If truth be told, each one of us in this room, the gospel comes today to comfort us. If we're humble and we're honest, because all of us are in situations that are not what we thought like. There's an area in our lives, if we're honest, in each of us in this room that actually says, this is not what I pictured. And you know, Christ is very near to the small, to the detail. You know, I don't want to be like so big about, you know, the topic. I don't want to go into the heavenlies, the cherubims and the arch, the archangels, you know, all that kind of stuff. No, no, I want to talk about that area this week that, for real, that we have to say to Jesus, are you with me? I, I, I want to be pruned. I want to be, I, I want to be instructed. I want to be given wisdom. I want to be, be getting near to you. But sometimes, if I'm honest, I need a change of mind. I need, I need something in my mind to change because... You know what? This is what everyone told me to do. And you know what? It didn't help. It, it just didn't help. It, didn't, it was not sufficient. It's not that it wasn't good. They were well, very well-intentioned, you know. And, and the gospel is not meant to be well-intentioned. The gospel is meant to chisel away your stones, the stones of your heart. The, the gospel is not meant to actually feel good. This is the part of the meeting, you know, that you just kind of like zoom away and then see the rest of the notes, you know. Because Sundays are not a place of feeling comforted by in my feelings. But it's to say, Jesus, what do you see in me? Finally. Finally you ask me. How many times this week we ask Jesus, finally, can you say something? Or how many times this week you heard Jesus say, finally, can you shut up? Sorry, um, can, I, can I say something? Because sometimes we, we, we redact things. You know, we just, we just blow the horn and we get on with, you know, and, and we talk to Jesus all the time because we're very, very near to him. No, we're not. We're just giving him a recipe for our own pleasure. And we are asking him to endorse it. That's what we call prayer. But sometimes when we mature, sometimes we come back to Jesus and say, finally, after all these stupid things that I said and that you knew, can you say something? Can you give me the ability to hear? Humility. Humility of mind, humility of spirit. When we go to the Holy Spirit, we go to Jesus and say, I don't have to prove anything to you, and I know it. Can you give me the ability to hear beyond me? What a beautiful moment. That's when heaven gets cooking, my son would say. You're cooking, you're cooking. You know, every time my son sees Something's gonna about to happen. Let him work, let him work. You know, someone someone is doing something of profit, you know. He says, like, oh, he's cooking, he's cooking, you know, like, and I have learned to see that sometimes God is wanting to see that moment. And we should call it as it is. Heaven is cooking. Heaven is cooking something in this house. And he's not cooking it with Masses. He's cooking it with intimacy. I mean, that it's just, it already is like Jesus. You know, like it, if you look on the bigger spectrum, yeah, it sounds like him. But let's go a little bit into details, can we? Yeah? The background of this is finally. Like there has been a story. There has been moments that you had not listened there is a prophet, there is an apostle, there is a, a, a father in the faith that has gone af, like further than the people that he's talking to. And, uh, and he's almost trying to prove himself, almost having to prove himself. And there's a level of discomfort in his flesh, but 
he's able to be present. Most of us, when we are uncomfortable, we get absent. We get absent. We get absent of our own lives. We get absent of our own relationships. You know, when he's uncomfortable, we just get out. But this person, Paul, Paul who writes to Philippians, the people of Philippi, actually, Philippia, um, he is present in his discomfort. So he's actually kind of saying, finally, I got your attention. Hello. Hello. You know, how many times you have called a brother or sister or mom or dad or a friend and they didn't pay attention when you were asking. And, and someday, a random moment, you know, out of the blue, they call you, they message you, they WhatsApp you, whatever we use now, they discord you. Um, it sounded very biblical, <laughs> almost. <laughs> And they all of a sudden, like, they get it. And you're like, finally. <laughs> Have you ever been in a conversation that you, you jump in because they, I mean, and I'm setting you up, yeah? Just defend, 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 defense, defense, defense. Okay. When you walk into a conversation when they said the right thing, but they didn't have the right insight. That sounds like Jesus all the time with us. Jesus says something and we hear something from God and then all of a sudden when we say, yeah, I know. And because this and that and the other. And Jesus is like, no, you didn't get me, right? What is the character of Jesus in what he is saying? Sometimes we actually fall in love with religion. Religion means rules, regulations. But Jesus is way more than that. It's transformation and eternal life. So finally means do you get me? No, 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 no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The rest of the stuff, I mean, it's useless to know the Bible if you know the Christ. If you don't know the Christ in the Bible, hello, you can know. I mean, how many artists I actually have found in inspiration for songs that are like mainstream Grammys are won with inspiration, but relationship is different. It's time for a change of mind. And Jesus is calling us through this word today for a change of mind. So it's, it is not only the background that we have to see, because all of us actually have to go through the background. There's noise in all of our lives. If I ask you individually, if I walk into a very confined room with each one of you asking, what, what is the noise? What is the background noise in your life? You will start depicting situations and friendships and ideas and temptations if you're kind of more spiritual you know like you go psalm 22 said you know like and i've been struggling with this pastor chris no what is the background because to be able to have a change of mind we have to know where our mind is set our background usually tries to kill the mission of Christ in each one of us. This is food for your notes. Most of the things that you are experiencing in the background that you have, everything that the noise, if we're going to call it something, in your life is coming against the mission that you have in your life. Throughout your life, all the noise, everything that you have been battling, all those Noises, all those voices that said you cannot do it, you're not good for it. Oh, no, this is why you're good for that because you are built that way. That comes from human thought. You know, forget about all those things. I'm making something new. And in that sense, where is the mission? Because the background always comes to define you and usually comes to cut you short from how you're known. The mission, the mission is to be known how you're known. When you walk into the room, when someone passes away, one of our friends has passed I mean, I don't know if you have had any friends pass away lately, but I've had friends. And everyone goes to the funeral and says, like, this person was like this. You were known. And sometimes we think that walks very far and different from our mission. Our mission is not to survive like the world teaches us. Our mission is to allow Christ to show what he planted in each one 
of us. Not to be susceptible only to the background. The background only gives us information how to love back through the mission. Because the mission is, cannot be detached from love because God is love. A changed mind, a change of mind sees the background as an opportunity. Sometimes we see it as like, I'm fighting against this and I'm fighting against that. But a change of mind teaches us how Christ can come through what he planted in each one of us. And it's not easy and it is not pristine. You're not going to go out without a scuff. But the reality of this is that Christ is going to be seen and your vulnerability has to be known. It is not that you have to be a superhero. The world is being indoctrinated with superheroes for the last 15 years, if I'm not wrong. You know, every movie teaches us how somewhere in the world, someone would save the world. But someone did that 2,000 years ago. That's an old story that is like they're stealing the play. But that hero lives in you. And I'm not looking for caves and superpowers and stupidity and independence from the Holy Ghost. You know, I'm looking for people that are able to say and harness everything they are. Their independence, they are those that I'm looking for. At least, I don't know what you're looking for, but I'm looking for people. I'm looking for people that can kill away the independence from the Holy Spirit and harness their lives and their story to a bigger picture, to a plan. To God. So they're able to see that there's a background noise, but that's only to point to their mission. Second, if I can. It's only three, don't worry about it. It's only 45 minutes and two more hours. The internal conversation. I don't know you. And uh, I'm going to cut you down in your laughter. You know, but I, I want to go back into your brain because this is only works, the Bible, the Holy Spirit only works with people that have integrity inside of themselves. There is internal conversation that each one of us have. Do you remember the last 50 thoughts you had this morning? No? Okay, that 50 is a big number, right? Hello. Do you, remember, do you remember when you were deciding what to dress or what to wear, why you, why you did that? Do you thought of details? Okay, maybe, maybe not, you know, because that's kind of mundane, you know, for the religious among us, you know, they're stoning me right now emotionally. So, but for some of us, you know, maybe I can take it kind of near to the heart. When was the last time you looked at yourself in the mirror and said, wow, he loves you? Can I get nearer? I'm coming for you. When was the last time you really looked at yourself in the mirror and said, oh, my God, heaven knew what he was doing. I love you. You're the guy. Having trust in you. Have you ever talked to yourself like that? Because sometimes we need to take it all the way to the enemy's camp because everything else outside of that thought has criticized everything in us. Have you ever harnessed the criticism of thoughts and wonders? Have you ever thought, no, I'm too thin? In a season, and then in another season, you say, well, I'm too fat. All of a sudden, no, I'm single. And then in a different season, you say, well, I'm married. And in a different season, you actually have, are you with me? Yeah, is that, is that okay? We can, can we go there? Because we have to understand that he knows all our seasons. And we're going to go into a third person. And I say person with a reason, Holy Spirit. But before we get there, I want to set the, the steps for it, like the floor for his presence. Last, last Sunday, we were talking about Pentecost. And most of us actually have not been in a room where everyone lost control about what the Holy Spirit does. 
Some of us actually have heard of the Holy Spirit. Some of us have read of the Holy Spirit. But the majority of us have not been in a room when the Holy Spirit is doing whatever he wants and, and you got to let go. So that means there's room for your wonder. You don't have to say, oh, I'm less. But your control will be broken the minute you meet the person of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? I felt something break in that moment. That was for something in this room. There's a conversation. And you know what? The conversation with the Holy Spirit, this is the second point. I'm not going to the third. Your wait. Your wait. We have not gone even through the scripture yet. The conversation comes to make us aware. And when we are aware, when we are aware that we need the Holy Spirit, when we are away and aware and we are humble, there's something in us that says, wait, wait, whoa, whoa. Let me listen. Have you ever had a conversation with someone that knew more and was able to explain it better? And all of a sudden, you had doubts in that area, and they came into the room and say, whoa. And you said, uh-huh. This is the moment we say, aha, uh -huh, to the Holy Spirit. So now we go into the Word of God. When we go into this, we're talking about several things because it says, it calls us to say, finally, brothers and sisters, in the world that we're living today and is so genderized, everything you say about a gender will be taken up in arms. It, it, it is a... It is a situation, you know, you have to justify why you mm, somehow even this and that and the other had to kind of incline your thoughts to a gender. But God is healthier than that. The world that we live in is sick. It is obvious that we have genders. But God is calling us to be healthy. But you know why he genderizes it like that in this word? Because there are roles for the brother and for the sister to live by. Because when God is healthy, he doesn't have to escape the truth even because of the background, point one. The point one was background, background noise. Hey, but brothers and sisters, point two, awareness. When we walk into this word, in this piece of text, God is asking us to understand what is our role. When God took men and women from the people that he had them investing in, they were investing and they were producing a specific fruit through the Holy Spirit. When God took Moses, he took direction. Then he replaced it with Joshua, with strength and impetus for a new season. But when he took Dorcas, it was a woman that would sow for the orphans and she would nourish so she would be the one that nourished. Moses was not known for nourishment. Moses would go for months up to the mountain. Absent father, some people would say. The ones that are like, kind of like, they need attention. And Dorcas was with all the attention. But she was busy sowing to nourish. So uh, there is a vocation in each gender and not let you and your faith be fooled and your walk with life would be come out, you know, of what God wants you to understand, brothers and sisters. When you read the Bible with context, it is deeper and it's fuller, it's more complete. The ideas of God, the thoughts of God are higher than our thoughts. When God has to underline brothers and sisters, he's not only understanding you as a gender, he is understanding your role in the community. Finally, finally, I can feel heaven saying, Amen. For those that you are thinking, Amen. Finally. Brothers, when all the things, all the systems, all the arguments around us are erasing the lines, God still throws 
align heaven, who created genders, essentially, kind of like in, in a mercy moment, says, let us see this more complete. But I'm not going to step there because in YouTube I'm going to get canceled in a second. So I'm just going to continue. Is that okay? I think they had enough. Portions. Portions is better. Portions, yeah? So change of mind. Brothers, finally. Sisters, finally. Hello. But then it goes deeper. It says, whatever is true. And it's whatever usually in... In my context, with my rebellion, with my background, I would say they don't care about. But when I read the context of the Bible, it says everything that is true. Because true cannot deny true. Are you with me? So sometimes we say, like, whatever is true. And, and we say with that rebellion, with that passive aggressive rebellion, you know, we don't want to be instructed. All of us have a little bit of a bean of stupidity and, and, you know, hello, whatever. Have you ever answered to anything, whatever? You know, like you didn't mean God bless you. Um, <laughs> yay. Am I alone? Am I alone in this one? No, am I alone? Any man, yay, man, Chris, preach it, whatever. <laughs> The reality of it is that whatever in our flesh means I don't want to face that. I don't want to deal with that. And it's self. It's flesh. is dead. But Christ that lives in us is the one that in this scripture says whatever. Point at it. I did that. I covered that. I overcame that. Try to show me something I didn't conquer. Go to the ends of the earth and to the ends of your soul and into the ends of your mistakes and show me one thing I didn't conquer. Christ stands tall saying, finally, brothers and sisters, in all of your roles, whatever, Today we say Christ is more than whatever we can think and imagine. Finally, brothers and sisters, we are able to tap into the truth that Christ is better and bigger and stronger. And if we start taking it by pieces, you know, we're going to do that in 13 seconds. But I might have an amen in the house, you know, I don't know, where is that there? But hello, Christ said Whatever, whenever, whatever, whenever, whatever, whenever, I, I am. Finally, brothers and sisters, you get me. It is what, like, it's almost like a, it, it, it preaches to us that Jesus is saying, ah, you got it. Christ with me, the hope of glory. So, okay, so if we go into the nitty-gritty, we take notes, you know, it's just like, these are the filters. Have you ever been into a situation that you needed a filter? Maybe you're like a coffee freak, like some of you guys. No, I'm not going to call you by name, but hello. I, I see you. I, you're kind of freaky. You're not freaky about your heart, but you're freaky about coffee. I know you. I know. Don't worry about it. You know, hello. That's for free. You can take that home. Um, there's some of us that are freaky about what we eat. You're not freaky about what you speak, but you know, whatever, whatever. You know, you're a freaky. You're a freak. Just like, yeah, okay, but God, God loves freaky. Don't worry about it. <laughs> These are the filters that God is asking us to observe today. Are you with me? You want them? You don't want them. You read the word, but now you want to apply it? It is what it is. Okay, filters. Here we go. I love when the Holy Spirit is having fun with us. Brothers and sisters, whatever is true. True. What is actually true? True means what is certain and what is verified. Some of us actually kind of wonder. This word, I mean, let's, I mean, we have talked so much. I have talked so much. You have thought so many other things, you know what I mean? That maybe we, you forgot about the word. It says actually to be said, you know, it says like finding the brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. That's our word. That's what the Holy Spirit is wanting us to understand. True. What is true? What is true? What is certain and what is verified? 
Sometimes we give our mind, we give the field of our mind. In the Bible it talks about the enemy, the devil, Satan actually went to the highest places to actually kind of try to conquer, to be like God, the highest places. What is the highest place you have in your life? Your mind. So he went into your thoughts, a change of mind. And we're going to go through the lives of so many people that actually had a change of mind and got met them in that change. I woke you up, I think. Hello. Good morning. Because God is about to do something. So what is true is what is certain and what is actually verified. Most of the things that we think about during the day, most of the things that we allow this field to be playing with is not certain and not verified is what if one of the biggest enemies of faith is the what if we actually have to stop there we're saved we can come to the altar right now and ask for prayer someone will come from the corner and pray for you but if you're humble if you want to receive something from god i don't want your chair and your pride to stop you coming to the altar today we're going to have a crazy day because god is saying whatever is true and we have been harnessing our strength behind things that are not true. Everything has been an if for the longest that we can remember. If we go back into everything, everything in our lives, everything with our kids, everything with our marriages, everything with our boyfriend, everything with our workspaces, everything with our educations, everything that we think God called us to be has, behind, has been behind an if. And God is wanting to deliver us from the if. The if is something that is drying our faith. And the devil hides behind your if. And you have to be becoming a Christian that is not only indoctrinated. You have to become a disciple. You have to go up the mountain and down the mountain and say, because of God. This is not for us to actually think about what we're thinking. This is us for us to be based on his character. There's no ifs in his character. So there's no ifs in our lives. There's no ifs in our decisions. There's no ifs in our mindset. There's no ifs. Everything happens, whatever, whatever. He said, whatever. I am God. Jesus came to defy all of it. Away with this religion that makes us weak. He came with a lot of whatever's, mate, and I'm going to give them to you in a minute. But the first one, whatever is true, he's the one that said, I am the truth. T-H in the end. But there's sometimes that Jesus had to certify. And there's some areas in our life that we want to, in our emotions, in our Western style communication with God, how I feel. No, 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 whatever. I don't care what you're feeling. Whatever. You got to live in the whatevers of God. There has to be a change of mind. You cannot control the Holy Ghost. You cannot control the plans of God. You cannot control the situations around you. But what you can decide is to be living in the whatevers of God. Whatever is. He said, I am. Is. I am. Whatever is. I am. And I feel Jesus pacing through the room. I don't know why. Holy Ghost might have some, you know, hello. Thank you, Jesus. After that, he drops another one. It's beautiful. Are you ready for this one? Should we leave it for next Sunday? No, next Sunday? You don't want next Sunday? Like, what if, you know, like, hello, you know, things are going crazy. Right? So we need it today. Noble, whatever is noble. Whatever is noble. What, who? what is noble? But noble, it's well defined in the dictionary for us. Can you uh, bear with me two seconds? It says, uh, actually, you know what? It's a rank. It is a social standard. Whatever is of a social standard. Oh, but that sounds, that sounds too, too close to what we're following today. We know it's smoke, isn't it? But there's a second one. It's a, a title. Also a social standard. So a rank a stature, a recognition, a title. But then he started getting better. 
Can we get into it? He said, whatever is, whatever is noble is, is one thing that is uncorrupted morally. Woo! That only speaks Jesus to me. Whatever is, whatever is true and whatever is noble, whatever it has not been corrupted morally, whatever has not been corrupted, and also it means whatever has been generous. That was very noble of you. Have you ever heard that of you? You know, that when you go into charities that people are like kind of spilling the feathers and they're spilling the money, you know, they, they will go into this. Uh, that was so noble of you. God doesn't play that game with us. He's not actually passing receipts into our lives when he, when he did what he did for us, you know. I know there's some people, there's some of us that actually will go to God, well, I obeyed you, so you should. God is not like that. Don't try. Don't be stupid. But like, go, be, be back. Be humble. You know, be broken. You know, hello. It works better. He will hear you kind of like, and you actually, be fair, he hears you, but you will hear him better afterwards. Don't worry about it. Um, that's for free. Don't worry about it. Noble. 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 The Spirit of God, whatever is noble, Jesus comes to inhabit us. Spirit of God leads us in thoughts that are noble, and that means uncorrupted and generous. But even more, for the man in the house, he teaches us how to be brave. And I know women are naturally brave, so that's why I'm talking to the men. Don't worry about it. The women say amen. <laughs> there you go. I knew there was some feminists in the house. <laughs> You got to cover all the corners, boy. <laughs> you know what? We need the Holy Spirit to be brave. To be brave. And lastly, noble means self-sacrificing. When was the last time that you woke up? When was the last time you were in a situation and said, you know what? I could, but Christ. I could, but Christ. A change of mind comes to our life. The Holy Spirit doesn't come just to put tongues of fire and do a display or a show, you know, because that we have in churches all around the world nowadays. But what we need in the streets is self-sacrifice. We don't need a show. We need people that are, like, genuinely saying, Lord, you know what? I don't do me. I do you. Because if they saw me, they, my God, they would get lost. But if they see you, they will have a better chance. They will have a life. They will have an eternity. Self-sacrifice. Whatever is true, whatever is noble. We're only point two, baby. We're getting, are we harnessing it? I got like 18 other points, but I don't know. Hello. Whatever is right. Right means established. Whatever is right, think about those things. Whatever is right, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is established. You know, and sometimes we say, well, there's a lot of things that have been established. But I ask you how many of those things last the time that their main leader has not been there. Establishment. But if we actually want to take it from the organizational bit, we're going to go into more kind of like a normal individual perspective. We're going to say, okay. Everything that is right is on the mark. And the Bible actually teaches us that sin is actually to miss the mark. So whatever is to miss the mark, don't think about that. So if we actually kind of, if you thought this was not about how you think, don't worry about it, I'll take you back there in a second. The Bible is actually teaching us how to think, whatever is right, whatever is true, whatever is not missing the mark. Whatever is not kind of accomplishing what we want in our thoughts and our motivations, and not only that, whatever is, whatever is healthy, whatever is well pruned, that's a beautiful picture of a thought. That's a well pruned thought. That was the last time you said, well, I don't know, when was the last time I said to Joanna, well, love, that was a good thought. Well pruned. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I was on the most anticlimactic, unromantic moment, you know, to my wife, you know, like, she was like, what? <laughs> it's like, 
But sometimes we go in a relationship with God and we take thoughts that are second class. When you value the presence of God, you take thoughts to God that are well pruned, that you actually, you actually have thought what you're saying to God. Immaturity leads us into vomit. Ah, God, you got to listen to whatever I say. But love curates. We take to God thoughts and say, Lord, knowing you, this is the best I could bring. It is not that you are like controlling what you're saying. It's that you don't want to present something that was not inside of his whatever. And sometimes we take God for granted, but maturity never takes anything for granted. Love never takes anything for granted. So it comes with a thought that is curated, a thought that says, okay, in this I might be wrong, and I am in doubt, but I bring you the best. I didn't bring you everything. I pruned that out to bring you the best so you can tell me what do you want and why are your thoughts? Can I have an amen? amen. Is this going deep? Yeah. We have two more points. It's going to be bigger. Okay. We're going to go whatever is pure. I know. Well, if you go musically, we have a lot of musicians in the house, you know. And when you go musically, it has to do with the tune. And it has to do with the frequency. And sometimes... You know, there, there might be relationships, if we're talking to the general audience now, not only the musicians, there might be relationships that we are in that uh, you don't have the feeling and you're pushing for a frequency. You're like pushing to kind of get along. And sometimes in that sense, you have to compromise on the purity of your thought. I'm not saying you're sinning. I'm saying you're not being completely honest. And we compromise on our honesty, whatever is pure in those things you think. And you don't, you don't bring that life into the conversation, but you compromise and you don't put purity. Purity is what is an adultered, what is not polluted, what is not diluted. Do you see where the Holy Spirit is going? He's trying to walk us from the rejection and, uh, and the, the lust and the rebellion bricks into a livelihood, you know, that actually brings salvation and healing. And it just brings us to be not only healed normally and all us like as a person, but through us that it can be translated into the livelihood of others. And sometimes we want God to heal us but we don't think of the next person. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, think about those things. And if I can explain it through with one word, whatever is blameless. And as Christians, you and me were professional Olympic blamers. We get out of this building and we start blaming people for things. You blame your dad and your mom for things. You blame your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your wife, your kids, your dog for things. You know, you blame things. You're a professional. You're Olympic. I mean, if there were medals for blaming, blaming that would be an Olympic stadium moment. Like, there would not be one stadium in the world that could hold all the people that are blaming people around and God wants to make us free from that idol sorry sport sorry whatever stadium sorry whatever it is pure God wants us to be pure he doesn't want us to be in the game of bla blaming people around but no this happened because that person that's called pride I don't care what situation and how right you think you are God is above your rights. 
And he said, don't think about your rights. He gave all his rights away so you could be right. And so you can be pure. So away with the blaming game. This happened because if you have an internal, I don't know what name, because someone was going to get hurt with me, you know, in that one. I, she looked at me like, I'm doing Chris. I, I was going to say a name, my usuals. It was a Carlo or Shaniqua, you know, this black and white, you know, in that one. This is like, whatever, just judge me. But you always would be that person that would be blaming someone in your story. You always be the judge and the jury. And I don't know if you're, if you're able to let go of the right or be the judge and the jury. Can you? Can you let go? No pollution, no dilution, no pride. Remember all the rest of the things that the Holy Spirit is trying to. Yeah. And we start finishing. I mean, who wants more? I have more. You, know, you got more? Oh, you guys entertained today? Well, there you go. There you go. I got two more. I got lovely, and I got admirable. We're going to finish this with that. Whatever is lovely, what is love for you? Is love what, what you feel when someone caresses your ego? Is love what you think you need? So if God provides, let's just take it to God because you're going to complain. It's like, don't blame him, you know? It's like, hello. Um, is love when you receive from God what you think you need? But what if, if I expand that point, what if you needed more and you didn't know how to ask? Because your mind was on the way. Maybe your mind was saying, God, I know you can do all things, but for me, and you have dissected yourself from his character, and you're taking a hold of smaller portions. You're taking a hold of like the salad bar instead of the whole buffet. When you say, God, I know you are, but you're saying to God, diluted, polluted, whatever is lovely comes to challenge that. And it heals us from our rejection, from our orphanage, from the spirit of God, from that disconnection, from that distance. And he says, I want to give you more, but you got to recognize me in your life. If you recognize me, I can live through. I can bring forth. I can be. And you can get it. Is that okay? One last point, admirable. We, we have another one, but this is kind of like you're getting me tempted. We're going to summarize them. Yeah, is that okay? Admirable. Whatever is admirable in those things, you shall think. Admiring means I look up to. It means it is superior to where I am at. So there's an element of submission and humility but some of us actually take it for manipulation. Some of us actually would say, no, you're so much better. So we get in favor with that part of God. Lord, you're so good. But you don't put parts of you into the goodness of God so they are transformed. You can talk that in small talking conversations, relationship, human stuff. You know what I mean? But when you talk it with God, you got to talk about it with a lot more reverence. And you got to talk with God, God, is, you're so good. When was the last time you said, God, you're so good, but you didn't back it up with your actions? I mean, I do it like an Olympic athlete, you know what I mean? I don't know you. I'm honest. I'll tell you in front of you. I'm, this is getting YouTube, bro. You know, like for real. But the reality of it is that we, day in and day out, we step out of he, who he is, and we talk about him, and we feel satisfied because we are in our flesh. But God is not calling us to walk in religion. He's calling us to walk in Christ. So all that flesh kind of sounds good, looks good, makes a good video. But where are, what, what is the turnaround of that moment? 
if it, was, if it was humble, if it was true, and if it was noble, undiluted, unpolluted, if it was actually, you know, right, it will have fruits that will be a marvel. We're called to be an example. And some people nowadays, they hate to be called an example. People are escaping around the world from the position of being an example. Why? Because they're taking the glory for themselves. Whenever you don't take the glory for yourself, you don't escape from being an example. Because you're not, you're not the product. You're the grace. You're not saying, this is I am. You're saying, this is what he has done. It's called testimony. It's called Bible. It's called the truth. So nowadays, Christians, we run around like headless chickens trying not to be an example because we're going to be hunted down for a minute. But we are taking from the world the nutrition for the season to save our own. For those that save their own will lose themselves. But for those that live themselves down and sacrifice will win their soul. This is not the season to back off. This is the season to be an example, to be admirable. For those that are saying, you know what, they don't have everything perfect, but they're going to God. And I want that God. You know what? Because they can call it as it is. They're not perfect. I see them. I'm their neighbor. I'm their boyfriend, their girlfriend, you or whatever. But you know what? I can see where they're aiming. Their intentions are pure. They're admirable. And that's the beauty of Christ in us, of the gospel, admiration. Whatever is admirable in those things you think, whatever you're thinking will change the way you live. I want to call the worship team back. Because God has talked to us about being near to him. He has talked to us about certainty, what is true. He has talked to us about, you know, the background noise. He has talked to us about, you know, the, the internal conflicts that we all have. But he also talked to us about the workings of the Holy Spirit. And this has, this has been a bit more of a teaching Sunday than a preaching Sunday. But I believe the Holy Spirit has something special for each one of us. I believe that God wants to supply, that he wants to give us access, that he wants to un underline for us, if you're taking notes, how to depend in God, how to, how to take it back to our love for him, to be simple. Yes, we come to church. We congregate. But what is going on in our minds? That's what he's more interested in. So as we pray and as we worship, I believe there's, a, there's several of us that are having to, this week, think about these points and maybe understand what, is, what are our thoughts underlining. Are they underlining Christ? Are they underlining our flesh, our wants, our longings that come from our needs, maybe our rejection, maybe our rebellion, maybe what I want to do, maybe they're coming from our rights. What, what is that that is coming into our thought? What does it explain about our mind? And how serious we take the Holy Spirit when he walks into our life and through our hearts, through the corridors of our experience right now, right here. He wants to be in every area. If he's Lord of some, he's not Lord at all. He wants to be Lord of all. So he's in this season trying to bring word that aligns us, that heals us. But how are we going to be aligned if we're not looking at the line? 
How are we going to be healed if we cannot really even face our own wounds? The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want to save David, Psalm 23. But for that, you have to acknowledge him. And today is one of those words that wants to take us deeper and stronger. And I want to pray for us. Are you with me? Has this helped you? Is that okay? Has it been a bit deep, you know, I don't know. But I think it has helped my soul when I was preparing my life and my heart for this one. I was saying, God, this is, this is intense. This is really deep. This is really good. And I want it. I want it in my life. And I want your presence to flow through the room, Lord.